So, as, as I said, this work comes out of a book um, entitled Culling the Masses, the Democratic Origins of Racist Immigration Policies in the Americas. And I'm not even going to present an overview of the book in only 15 minutes, but rather briefly ask this, this major empirical puzzle, which is how is it that a consensus in the Western Hemisphere that racism was a good thing and that the selection of immigrants should have continue according to ethno-racial criteria, how did that consensus in the 1920s shift to an anti-racist norm not very long afterward? And as I ask that question and answer that question, I'm going to analyze the degree to which diffusion, policy diffusion among countries played a role in this uh, seismic shift in immigration policies throughout the Western Hemisphere and in fact beyond. So that is, how did we get from a situation in which universally Chinese were excoriated and 19 out of the 22 countries that we investigate in the Western Hemisphere had explicit anti-Chinese immigration policies. On the right, you'll see the news of Chinese exclusion um, as it was celebrated in San Diego, where I live in, in 1882. How did we get from that to the situation that, that Doug Massey just uh, referred to the end of the national origins quota system in 1965, which is not just a U.S. Uh, story. We usually think about it, at least in the U.S., in those terms. But if we look at other countries in the, in the Western Hemisphere, we see a related, sometimes different, sometimes similar set of policy instruments that also specifically are dealing with, with race, ethnicity, national origin as a criteria of immigration admission and or a naturalization. So in Argentina, going back to the 1853 Constitution, uh, there was a provision which is still in effect in Argentine law today that the government will foment or will promote European immigration. And yet in Argentina, current constitutional thought is that Koreans are the new Europeans because the notion of a modern person that was prevalent in the 19th century, referred to Europeans. Today, Koreans are considered the modern people par excellence, and therefore, this is entirely consonant with the Argentine constitution. So how do we get both these, these big uh, convergences and policy shifts as well as, as divergences over time? I'm only going to show you one, one chart just to, to make this broad point about this, this seismic shift. And the chart here, you're looking at the number of countries in a given decade with explicit discrimination against the immigration of a particular ethno-racial group. And they're ordered by the groups that were most systematically discriminated against. So the blue line on the top represents the number of countries with explicit anti-Chinese measures. And then you can see similar for the Japanese, Middle Eastern, and, and so forth. And the, the only point that I wish to make here is that you see this incredible growth where all countries pretty much out of, out of the 22 adopted some kind of uh, anti-Chinese and then with slight less frequency anti-other um, discriminations. And yet they also very quickly fell away. And it just seems very unlikely, even just looking at this one graph, that conditions that were internal to each country can explain both this onset and this, this rapid decline. So this, this question gets at a basic uh, problem for comparativists. And I'm a comparative historical sociologist. And there is a recognized problem with the way that we typically do business, which is to rely on the million methods of agreement and difference, as elaborated by John Stuart Mill and his system of logic. That is, in the method of agreement, typically we try to figure out what are the conditions that are the same in each uh, set of countries uh, that might yield a similar outcome, or more powerfully in the method of difference. Uh, if we hold constant all other conditions that are the same in each country and we find that there is a different condition in one particular setting, that yields uh, a different outcome, and we think that those things are causally related. That's kind of the, the business as usual. And a recognized problem here is that sometimes the units are themselves interacting. And what happens in country A influences what happens in country B. This introduces a whole set of problems in which sequence uh, and not simply uh, the same underlying conditions have to be dealt with. So how do we how do we do that? Well, there are many many scholars who have 
dealt with questions of policy diffusion, policy learning, transfer, convergence. There are a number of different terms that are trying to get at this issue um, in slightly different ways. And for the remainder of my presentation, I want to talk very briefly about three different mechanisms of policy diffusion that we looked at in the, the context of this particular project and draw out some broader theoretical lessons that would be worth investigating in other contexts. I'll go through each of these, but the first has to do with the mechanism of strategic adjustment and specifically how important is geography in this mechanism, which I'll define in a moment. The second has to do with questions of emulation and, and modeling. To what extent is modeling shaped more by power asymmetries between countries as opposed to being part of some kind of shared uh, cultural or historical community? And then finally, a question about leverage. Um, and to what extent can leverage be applied not only by the strong over the weak, which is the usual way that things happen, but under what conditions can the weak apply leverage on countries that in most respects are, are much stronger. So let me say a word first about strategic adjustment. And by strategic adjustment, I'm referring to the mechanism in which policymakers in one country look at the way that policies in other countries have changed some kind of objective conditions, such as migration flows, and then they change their uh, policies accordingly. And we see many, many different uh, examples of this. Sometimes these happen after the objective conditions have, uh, have, have changed after the fact. This can be a very powerful mechanism, such as uh, when the US and Japan signed the so-called Gentlemen's Agreement, in 1907 that basically cut off Japanese immigration to the US. Almost immediately that rechanneled Japanese immigration to Canada and to Brazil. And those two countries came up with their own restrictive policies in response. Canada also conducted a set of gentlemen's agreements with Japan in response. Uh, in Brazil, there was a longer lag until the 1920s, but now Brazil is the largest a center of Japanese populations outside of Japan. It's a direct result of the US-Japanese Gentlemen's Agreement. The, the connections are extremely tight. Perhaps more surprisingly, sometimes we see uh, preemptive actions by policymakers who are aware of what's going on in other countries of immigration. They know what the planned policy changes are, and preemptively they act. So for example, in 1862, during the US Civil War, when there was uh, quite a serious plan to send African Americans, quote unquote, back to Africa or to other places in Central America. The Costa Rican government was aware of these plans and preemptively banned black immigration into Costa Rica as, as a preemption. As I said, these are very strong effects. And when we look at the effects of uh, the US on other countries of immigration, it's actually this mechanism of strategic adjustment that has been most powerful. Why the US has had this oversized effect, the volume of migration to the US during the late 19th, early 20th century from Europe was enormous. There was more migration from Europe to the US during that period than to the rest of the entire world combined. So the US policy had these, these outsized effects. And adjacency matters, sharing a, a border matters. We see a lot of these kinds of strategic adjustments in the context of Mexico, US, Cuba, US, uh, Canada, US. But we also see very, very long distance effects. I mentioned the case of, uh, of Japanese going to Brazil, many other long distance, um, Australia, Canada, other, other kinds of, of interactions as, as well. So what about cultural emulation? And this is a notion that, uh, that draws in large part from the work of John Meyer and the Stanford School on the ways in which policy models can come to be taken for granted as what modern states do, or to use the language of the 19th century, this is what a civilized country does, uh, where there's no, no one is forcing uh, policymakers in another country to change their policies, but they do it anyway because it seems like a good idea. And there are some very interesting ways that policy emulation takes place in an iterative fashion, sometimes over pretty long-term time scales, such that we often forget the origins of these, of these models. So this is especially the case in literacy requirements, requirements that immigrants be literate either in some language or to be literate uh, specifically in a European language. So for 
much of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, the, uh, the British government and the D Dominion governments promoted the notion of the, the so-called Natal formula uh, that began in what's now part of South Africa and Natal, which applied literacy requirements requiring incoming immigrants to speak a European language. And it was a, a technique of, of racial selection. Um, and that was very influential throughout uh, the, the British dominions and, and self-governing colonies. But the origin of that was the US and the US Congress passed a uh, literacy requirement um, back in uh, 1896. It was vetoed by the US president, but before it was vetoed, the, the government of Natal explicitly invoked the US example and said, what a great idea. We should do the same thing here in Natal. Um, and, and then you see this kind of a reverberation uh, throughout the Anglophone settler societies over the course of a number of decades before a bill was finally passed in the US that uh, overrode the presidential veto in 1917. And then later, the Canadians adopted the US model of a literacy requirement that applied to any language, um, and not specifically a European language, as the, the other dominions had done. So what is the, the direction of, of emulation? There's, there's a long-standing uh, body of research and studies of diffusion about the conditions under which emulation tends to take place. Uh, we find, not surprisingly, that there are extensive flows of policy emulation from uh, stronger countries to weaker countries, even across major sort of uh, cultural or civilizational divides. Uh, we also see a lot of diffusion of policies uh, within cultural communities that, that take place um, regardless of the level of power asymmetry among those countries. Uh, what we don't really find in this set of cases anyway, though, are countries that are in a much weaker position uh, being policy exemplars across uh, cultural communities. Let me say a word about leverage. As I said, uh, leverage can take place uh, using a number of different policy tools. The most dramatic is military leverage. And it takes place on a, coercion, on an, uh, a continuum of, co of coercion. Uh, we find examples of extremely high coercion, the most dramatic being military occupation, where the military governor simply says, from now forth, this is your immigration policy, whether you like it or not. Uh, this was the case in Cuba and exclusion of Chinese in a way that continued in Cuban policy even after it became nominally independent uh, a few weeks later. Uh, we see many other examples of low coercion, many of which are not successful. So after the U.S. excluded Chinese, it tried to get uh, Canada and Mexico to exclude Chinese so they wouldn't enter the U.S. through the back door. In the Canadian case, they were successful at, at applying pressure on the Canadians. In the Mexican case, they weren't. It was 50 years before Mexico outright excluded Chinese, and th th they did that for internal reasons, not uh, U.S. pressure. So what's most surprising and most interesting here are examples, though, where leverage comes from below in an effective way. And what are the conditions under which that happens? Well, there are a couple of things. First is that these happen typically as an example of collective action, where a number of weaker countries come together through some sort of institutional forum, such as the Pan American Union and or the United Nations, to press their demands collectively. But making demands is not enough. Um, the anti-racist provisions of the UN Charter were successfully imposed by much weaker countries uh, on the, the victors of, and well, the, the Anglophone uh, victors in World War II against their, their stated preferences and the beginning of those discussions going back to Dunbar Oaks in 1944. That would not have happened without systematic pressure from uh, Latin America and, uh, and, and China. The, the same is true in the Pan-American Union, not because Latin American countries were so racially enlightened themselves. It happened for very cynical reasons I don't have time to explain now, but it's all in this 500-page book if, uh, if you're interested. Uh, the other condition, though, is that there are issue linkages during times in which the more powerful countries have some almost existential need to garner support from weaker countries. And those two situations concretely in this set of examples have to do with World War II and the global Cold War, in which, for the first time, the opinions of much weaker uh, countries actually mattered. Uh, they, were, they were decolonizing, they had a seat at the table, and, and a global uh, fight for the hearts and minds of other 
publics and policymakers in the context of those two global struggles, they were able to link this issue of racist immigration policy, which worked to the detriment of people in the global south, to these titanic struggles. Thanks very much.